I'm delighted to introduce our, our first speaker, Stuart Ard Baer, who has a long association with Carfran Wild Food in the Borders, and is going to talk about uh, the 20 years of conservation work uh, that uh, has gone on at Carfran since it was purchased by the Borders Forest Trust in 2000. Uh, Stuart, over to you. Hello. Yes, well, yes, I am Stuart Rivere. I am a freelance uh, habitat ecologist, stroke field botanist. And yes, I have been involved in the Corifran uh, Wildwood project, which some of you will know about. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the history and such. You'll be able to catch up with that via Google and via links and things at the end. Um, but my opening slide here is a lovely little uh, patch of the ledge flora with those <laughs> roots. Uh, yes, and really what I'm going to talk about today is really the fate of the vegetation in general uh, after removing sheep and all grazing animals, uh, goats, to, uh, cattle, etc. It's now been removed for 20 years in total from some parts of the glen. Uh, it's really been very, very interesting indeed to see what happens to the vegetation let free of domestic grazing. A little bit about myself, I've just said, you know, basically that this slide here covers it. Uh, I also work commercially, occasionally, and have been involved in other restoration projects in the north of England and in the island. So, uh, but my main interest and my main involvement has been with Borders Forest Trust three large restoration and conservation schemes. Uh, just a little brief history of Gryphon here, just for you to skim over. The important point being for today's talk being the bottom 2000 to present. And as you can see, we've moved all the sheep, we've planted around about 700,000 native trees and shrubs, mainly in the lower part of the glen low 400 meters, uh, which was not really part of the qualifying interest for the dedication. Uh, and recently, we have started carrying out translocations with formal permission from Scottish Natural Heritage. And this, the first one we've tried so far is a bear route. We'll get to that later. Uh, just a little shot of before and after here. Uh, you can see on the left, 1999, open sheep walk, and in fact you can actually see sheep there, or the hill maggots, as some people refer to them. And here in, on the uh, right hand side, about 18 years later, you've got lovely developing oak bucks woodland, and heathlands and tall herb communities coming back all over. <laughs> Now built very small fragments of native woodland left in a few of the inaccessible cliffs and ravines where even the goats could get. Uh, they were absolutely tiny, make no mark on anything, but they are extremely important in terms of the story of what's happened since, as they provided excellent refugees for all manner of plants that could have otherwise been, otherwise been lost to sheep. And, uh, goats and no shade. And these are the three pictures of them here. Although it's a slightly exaggerated because you can now see all the planted trees round about these areas. Alas, I don't have any programs of the original plots. And as I was saying, they have turned out to be very good uh, depositories of native flora that otherwise would be no not so bad. And on average, in these three little clumps, I was rec reckoning 50 to 70 uh, recognisable shade or woodland plants within these tiny clumps. And bear in mind, these, these fragments are so small that you could actually count the number of tree stems relatively easy. That's how little these areas were. Well. Nevertheless, the right vital shade and protection from domestic storms. This also included areas without trees, but areas with just shade out of sunlight and so on. Uh, and here you can see actually this is barren strawberry, which is underneath a little clump of ash woodland that I left. Uh, 
which was one of the plants that spread quite rapidly with a bit of shade. Basic history here of what happened since we removed the sheep in 2000. Uh, as you would imagine, initially the grassy swords just thicken up and become very rank, which is exactly what happened. Ditto bracken tends to get very, very thick without sheep trampling it, and also incredibly tall. I mean, there are bracken stands there that haven't been touched at probably five foot in height, and you literally can't beat your way through them, you would need a machete or something. Then, gradually, laboring, but also heather, come back really pretty strong. And, but then some areas, they have been completely replaced in previous grassland within 10 to 15 years. Same is true of tall herbs like uh, grape wood rush. It has completely replaced Nardis grasslands, particularly on the north uh, basin slopes, so 450 meters and above, places like Risby Layers are unrecognizable now what we were. Uh, we planted woodland as far as possible to mimic natural conditions. That is to say, we were looking you know, food on bracken and on the heathery slopes of the slightly poorer ponsels above. We're looking for oak birch woodland on the better soils picked out by the vegetation. We were looking for ash elm and in wetter places, ash alder type woodland. Uh, and to be honest, it's, we've, picked, we've done it really well. It was well worth the effort. And now you can actually start to see recognizable natural plant communities actually form that, that you would likely see in natural conditions. So we're rather pleased about that. Uh, a lot of the what you call typical woodland herbs and plants uh, are immediately start coming back as soon as they get a bit of shade and a bit of, and, and they are free from grazing. So stuff like honeysuckle, which you can see on the right hand side here, which is from a tiny little uh, few uh, straggles of it uh, wrapped around a tree out the way of the goats. It's now completely covered the tree in about 10 years. Uh, stuff like wood anemone, wood sorrel, common dog, violet, pig nut, and a few of the more typical ferns have started coming away really quite obviously and quite the fern life has been a bit slower than I had hoped. I was hoping for quite quick fern takeover, but over the last two or three years, it really has started to take off, particularly more common ferns like broad butler and like male fern. But we've also got other interesting ferns which I'll come to later. And we are now also getting natural regeneration of trees and shrubs, both from our own planted stock and from the existing remnants of the bay, uh, with hazel and burnt cherry and all the uh, We've done a little bit uh, re-wetting and peatland restoration as well, and the bog is also coming back naturally itself. And it's starting to, uh, places like Rotten Bottom, which are really quite heavily eroded <coughs> and trampled the sheep. Uh, are now starting to uh, fall in peat. Your active bulbs again, sphagnum, cotton grasses, and heather colonizing bare peats. And we got the people from Tweed Forum in and with machines, and they helped fill up some of the crags and gullies and so on. And it seems to be pretty exciting. Uh, probably the most exciting thing that has happened, uh, we'll count for most of the pictures and stuff up in this board is the tall herb ledge in the Berry Commons vegetation, uh, which is one of the qualifying interests for this designated site for SSI and for SAC. And it was confined to a few uh, inaccessible ledges. Well, it is now everywhere, really. It's probably the most striking, other than the actual trees, it's probably the most striking thing for anybody interested in botany in the Glen now. Seeing tall herbs, long burn sides, uh, but you simply don't see in regular sheep. On top of that, we've also had the, the 
Bluebell, uh, which has made a, a tremendous comeback. Uh, again, this was not actually officially recorded uh, here, which is quite interesting because this is one of the most heavily botanized parts of the south of Scotland, going all the way back to people like Derek Ratcliffe, who cut his teeth in places like this. And there was never a official record of a bluebell ever being recorded. Well, they're all over the place now, very abundant. And the presumption is that they were just hiding away amongst the bracket and places like that. They couldn't, these are not new. So I find that very hard to believe. Also, after about 2007, about six, seven years into the project, we finally got round to establishing a bit of montane scrub up as high as about 720 metres, I think. Uh, and this involved a lot of the ledge flora as well, it's a nice crossover there. And without sheep, goats or cattle, all the plant life is now flowering because a huge abundance compared to what it used to be, uh, which has had a huge effect obviously on insects and bird life and other corn. Uh, I mean, it's interesting just to see heather whole hill size of heather in flower. And this picture here just gives you a little glimpse into what's actually happened with some of the tree planted areas. This, the photograph you see on the right is about 15 to 16 years growth of oak, birch, woodland. Uh, there's oak, birch, hazel, several olives in there. And if you can see the lighter limey green, light green, that's recovering blaeberry heath, boreal heath, and you can see yourself the little patches of uh, heather as well. And all of the former grasslands there below the original heather line are now heathland, mainly blaeberry heath, uh, which is also one of the Annex 1 habitats for the desert. So there's been a huge, as well as woodland recovery, Probably been more Eastland actually recovered than Woodland. Uh, a little picture here of how the bluebells are becoming really thick now, and some of these areas are now beginning to take on the character of, of natural bluebell oak, so with mixtures of lemon scented fir and uh, lots of bluebells and so on. So it's really quite, that has been a really pleasant surprise. It's, bluebell was one of the species we had originally thought about translocating, but we didn't think it was there. But it clearly shows you that plants can survive even heavy, heavy grazing in some little refugees and tucked away in places. And to the point where we've now got several stands of uh, bluebell at 400 metres and above, which is even pretty high, with no tree or shrub cover. Now this one here is about 400 metres, uh, maybe 450 tucked away in lemon scented fern and in thick patches of blue These came as a bit of a surprise to us because it wasn't at all obvious how they managed to cling on. There's no big dense patches of bracken here or quite how they survived is none of us are entirely sure, but it's one of the interesting things about projects like this. And it was stations like this, the one on the right hand side here, in a place we call Holly Gill. This is one of the stations for all tall herbs and indeed notable rarer plants. There's about three or four quite sizable cliff faces like this within the gully of the Firth of the Burn and where it becomes the Burn. And it's essentially from these places that most of our in more interesting plants, mountain sorrel, rose root, sea campion, etc., and all the other common wild herbs come to here. And especially down the burn. It seems the seed is just literally carried down the Craven Burn as basically the entire length of the Craven Burn now has some form of Lugula geum tall herb or what we used to call ledge community. Making it, and this is an Annex 1 habitat, bear in mind. I reckon there's probably more of this habitat at Craven now than there is in any other single site in the south of Scotland. In Certainly the rest of the triple SI, that is to say, the Grey Mare's Tail, which is still grazed, and over the hill in Black Hope, which is probably owned, which is still grazed. Uh, so this has been a tremendous uh, 
success. And I suspect if you've got guys like guys and girls like yourself up there, real field botanist expert, and I suspect the list of rare plants would actually grow. Uh, just a little uh, before and after here. This is the same place, believe it or not. On the left, you can see under sheep, just bouldery gravel along the burns and so on. And on the right here, if you can see where my cursor is, running up that line there, well, that is actually on that photograph here. So yeah, radical difference, <clears throat> radical difference from really close cropped vegetation, wiry grasses, a little bit of tormental, the usual sort of mix. As you can see now, very rich with tall herbs, a few trees that have seeded in themselves. Uh, quite a contrast, really. And indeed, the whole edges of the burns and shallower hollows and so on now look like this. And right the way down to 190 metres above sea level, so it's not even a hike. And here's more of it here, and a little bit of spill at the top. Uh, it's not only, I mean, most of these herbs themselves are not particularly rare, although some of them are, uh, but seen together like this in what you think of as sheep country, you know, is really quite spectacular. You know, you just don't see this very many places in Scotland, or indeed in Britain, or British uplands. And our uh, botanist visitors and botanical groups tend to hone straight to these places and never come away from them, to be honest, uh, rather than seeing what else we want to offer. Uh, and the, end, the notable plant list it's not only increased in extent, it's actually increased in species count. But several species in new editions will come to uh, Here again is typical uh, of this tall herb form. With some interesting plants here, we've got uh, uh, Saxon Praga hypnoides, and Sea Campion, and so on, and Rose Root. And the mountain sorrel you see down here. In the left hand corner, this is actually at about 180, 190 meters above sea level on open gravels next to the burn. You know, so the idea of this even mountain sorrel has to be questioned. It's quite obviously quite happy to come down on your lowlands if there are no sheep to eat it. <laughs> and again, I'll point out this is very important habitat in terms of the qualifying interest. Here are a couple. Of to the flora since 2000. On the right, you'll see alpine sawwort, which was spotted on a high crag up in the Firth of Gully, really quite a difficult place to get at. Uh, and we're starting to see more of it now appearing along crags and things. Again, that was no formal record of that at all before we started managing the place. Northern blaeberry, northern bilberry, bog blaeberry, Vaccinium luginosum on the right here. There was the only record we have of this was a couple of sprigs found by Chris Miles, and this was well after we'd taken the sheep off as well, on the edge of a peat hag. And I mean, you could count the branches on these little shoots, it was so little. Today, about 10, 11 years later, it now covers at least a hectare of black and bulk surface around where it was, where the hang on the edge of the hag, sorry. And has also now been found in new locations on peat, at least half a mile away. So that has been a raging success. Uh, I think it was originally spotted by Derek Ratcliffe in the 50s, but had never been recorded again until Chris Miles found it in about 2009, I think, or relocated. Other things, perhaps not quite so rare or notable, but still very interesting. Uh, and again, there's records of it, yes, in the Moffat Hills, but not in our patch. It's find clumps of it now really quite dense, like you see in this photograph on the right here, which is about two years ago, I think. And uh, wood bitter vetch, or Vicia oribus. Now we have one single plant of it. And over the hill at our, our new site, Tala and Gameshill, we also have one single plant, which is, I've cheated here because that's actually the one you're looking at, but I couldn't find a decent quality photograph of the one in the river. But it's much the same. 
as one isolated plant that you could see literally up hundreds of yards away because it was so different from the rest of the floor. We have tried to collect seed. We went back to relocate this very plant myself and Philip Ashmole last September, but couldn't relocate it to collect some pods to see if we could think about translocating it. But it does seem to be one of those plants that suddenly becomes prominent again once stalk is gone. A lot about ferns here. As I say, the, the more common ferns, woodland, typical woodland ferns, dryopteris, have been a bit slow coming, but they're getting away now. However, the fern life is really quite interesting, has done pretty well. You stuff like your beech fern, which has expanded greatly. I mean, I assume that perhaps goats would never there, I'm not quite sure. This bank you're looking at here with the second this picture where the cursor is here, for instance, it was just one little strip that and a tiny little crevice in rocks. And now it just completely covers these steep banks and completely covers them. Uh, and that's been a, a big change as well since the Google store. Parsley fern, again one of the uh, Annex 1 habitats. Again, it's taken off everywhere. Uh, it's more abundant on the trees now than it was when the sheep were there. Presumably trampling the fern, yes, again, that's probably the most common fern out in the open. There's a lot about scaly male fern as well. Some oak fern in crevices, but perhaps the most interesting thing, re removing grazing stock, is here. This is mountain male fern, uh, Dropsis oreades, uh, which is a grazing sensitive fern, which both goats and sheep will eat. And that was obvious because all of these stands you see here out in the open, these are all new uh, and really thickened up, and it's all over the place now. About 400 meters above, you find lots and lots of uh, mountain bell fern in amongst heather and grasses and other kinds of vegetation. So that's been something of a success story regarding the ferns. Uh, plant life in general, I've just included a little selection here. I could have, could have got hundreds of photographs of interesting plants just to give you an idea of a general idea of what's happening. Again, these have, a lot of them have colonized bare gravels that were within the burn shingle beds that were just immediately stripped bare of any vegetation by the domestic stock. Montane scrub. Uh, obviously, it's quite a slow business, and we didn't actually start it to about 2006, but we're getting there now. On the right and the left here, sorry, you can see uh, Salix ponum in flower, and there's quite a lot of it now. This is up in Firtham quarry area and it is now beginning to take on the look of natural salix lusula scrub that you can see in places like ben laws and so on with quite a few of your tall herbs and rose root and such as companions the juniper naturally enough has been a bit slower but it's, it's starting to get there now in some places low cross tree juniper scrub Again, you can see places like parts of the uh, And this is just a basic summary I've put up here so people can look at it in their own time as well. But just a basic summary of what's happened uh, with the more notable flora since we took over management. And as you can see, the new additions to, uh, are at the bottom there. Uh, I don't have photographs of the dental or the list there. Neither do I have one of the holly fern. Holy fern is the holy Carifen is the only place in the Moffat Hills where holy fern actually exists. But none of us have managed to relocate it. But with being such a specific plant in specific habitat, we doubt it's actually increased much. Again, this table is just a brief table from a published report I did from a resurvey, just comparing what had happened to the notable plants over the years. And again, you can look at this perhaps in your own time if you want to have more detail. As you can see, the oblong woods here is also translocated. And that was done by s &H before we actually became owners, I think, okay. uh, Which is interesting because we didn't have to go through. There was no paperwork. s &H just said, yes, we're going to do this. We've done it. But when we apply 
to translocate rare plants, because it's a designated site, we have to go through a whole formal process of application. And talking about, this is the first of the rare plants we have translocated. This is bearberry, and we collected it over in Dromelia. I don't know if anyone knows the site over there. It's probably the biggest uh, stand of bearberry heath I know in the south of Scotland. Uh, it's very interesting and well worth a visit itself. Uh, I just want to advertise a little bit about the best way to research what I'm talking about and get into the more details are our two published books which you can buy from the link shown here from BFT and all the money of course goes straight back into the cause. Uh, this book was just published last year, the, the second book, the Landscape Restoration. And all of the details and much, including plant lists, a couple of chapters in there, one by myself describing the whole vegetation story, another by David Long with the bryophytes, and the late John Savory done a lot of bird work. Uh, all of it can be quoted in there and you can find the original sources and stuff. And just a little bit about our future. Uh, we now own three, Borders Forest Trust now own three big sites uh, in the both of Tweedsmoor Hills, about 31 square kilometres, we think, two of which are contiguous. And the idea is to keep restoring these area and create an area, a large area in the uplands, what we call uh, the wild heart of southern Scotland. It's a long term idea being you can create habitat links down all the river corridors. Uh, potentially having a coast-to-coast -coast link across the linkage across the central southern uplands, joining the Tweed, the Annan, potentially the Clyde in the North Sea. So, uh, right, I think that's me about time. Uh, well, if you'll leave us perhaps five minutes or so, if anyone's got any questions. Stuart, thank you very much. So that was absolutely brilliant. It's fantastic to see uh, all that regeneration uh, of woodland and heathland. Uh, some of those photographs of uh, plants recolonizing river streams, uh, they're almost r reminiscent of what you might see in the Alps. It, it's truly inspiring. Yes, uh, that is something we've been very aware of, you know, a kind of, as you say, alpine tall herb flora. Uh, but for kind of, a lot of this we had all predicted, you know, having read all the books and the theories of what would happen. I mean, it was great conjecture. A lot of people, and some people still are, don't want us to remove sheep from some of these hills as they are worried about losing some of the more notable plant flo uh, flora, you know. And our argument was always, no, the complete reverse will happen. These plants are only in their uh, inaccessible refuges because of overstocking. Uh, and so on. And this would appear to be the absolute case at Carifran. And even in the early days over at Tal and Gameshall, which has only been un under restoration policy for five, six years, we're beginning to see exactly the same thing uh, with the notable for particularly broad leafed herbs and so on, becoming much more common. Uh, and of course, everybody understood that as soon as you remove the sheep, you're going to get a lot of heathen. Yeah. Higher up now, we're starting to get a lot more cowberry, crowberry, cloudberry as well. Uh, so we're starting to get really richer boreal and monte heaths, which is one of the qualifying interests of all the Moffat Hills SAC project. So we also feel that beyond ecological restoration, rewilding, we've also managed it proper way we should in, in Brit standard British nature conservation terms. Here we are, custodians of part of a triple SI and SAC, and we have increased the qualifying interest and the extent of the qualifying interest. We've also red squirrel back, pine martin, or jay, and gospel the senior quite often as well now. Uh, so from um, from a natural history point of view, to me, it's, it's been all gains and virtually no losses, really. Certainly been no losses of interest in the plant life. Uh, 
Okay, so so before uh, I ask Paul to put the first question, uh, first first participant question to you, can, can I ask a question of my own? Um, you're right beside uh, the National Trust for Scotland Greymere's tail property. Um, what what is your relationship with them? Do do, do you work in partnership? Uh, do you exchange notes and? Yes, yes, we have done stuff for them, particularly the ranger. Now, I believe he was paid off because of this COVID thing. So that's pretty bad. We were doing jobs together, particularly around the surviving Salix Laponum and other notable flora on, I can't remember the name of the crag, but just on the opposite side, the Raymer's Tower side of White Coombe. <coughs> and we had actually helped him, persuade him, uh, the ranger got a fence to fence the goats off. And we were getting tremendous comeback of all these plants, especially the downy willow, which we were collecting seed of. And a lot of the downy willow you've seen at Gryphon was collected from there. However, there was an avalanche uh, which broke his little fence, the goats go back in, and the last time I was up there it was all nibbled back down the golf course levels. I think, I have to be careful what I say here, but I think, yes, yeah, some people within NTS would like to basically follow us and do something similar. <coughs> uh, but at the moment, as far as they're concerned, it's recreation, people access, walking. Their primary concern, and they have tenancy agreements which they could have bought out but didn't. Uh, one of the things we thought about is could we perhaps come into a management agreement with them for at least the, the more notable areas that actually are adjacent to the We wouldn't own it, but we could manage it and we could get the fences in to do contracts and create plants and build grants to help us and things like that. So, yeah. fingers crossed. Yeah. Very exciting. Uh, thank you. Uh, right, Paul, uh, first question, please. Yeah, um, Russell's asked what length of fencing was needed and how much did it cost and who funded it? Ah, very good question. Well, the actual length, oh, off the top of my head, is it's a lot. Roughly. 14 miles around or something. Wow. Uh, and our new site is three times bigger uh, and also has a deer fence. Uh, the cost, I, I can't remember. You'd have to speak to somebody like Hugh Chalmers, who was a site agent at the time, or possibly Philip. I don't know. I didn't have anything to do with the cost of things. But it came certainly partly funded with the grant schemes we got. Uh, and in terms of management, that boundary fence has been walked once a month every month since January 2000 by volunteer. Regardless of weather, <coughs> even, in, well, even more so in snow, <laughs> to go and see if the fence has been broken or so. so that's quite an achievement. It also shows you the kind of work involved in something like restoration that maybe isn't obvious. Like people think of planting trees, and stirring up the ground, getting into some legs, taking off sheep. But finding people who are prepared to check a fence line in all weathers in pretty extreme conditions, uh, <coughs> you know, the big thing. Yeah, and I should point out that the boundary fence is actually gold fence. That is to say, it's about I think it's about Philip it worked out about nine inches or six to nine inches higher than a standard stock fence was enough to stop goats jumping over. They can if they want, but they seem too lazy. But obviously, there's still goats and the rest of them off at hills, which, you know, you obviously can't help when we're trying to plant trees. Uh, okay, um, can I put another question to you? Um, yeah. Has the vegetation become so impenetrable in places? Uh, this, is a, this is a question from Robert Northridge. He asks, has the vegetation become so impenetrable that uh, you have complaints from walkers? Well, uh, Yes and no. Uh, yes, there are places that are still very, very bad. <clears throat> and in terms of complaints from walkers, often that's of ourselves. People like me trying to do surveys out there, and there's no sheep tracks anymore, there's no sheep tracks. Your best hope is to pick up a badger trail and follow it. Uh, 
But generally, no, the higher ground is not so bad, it's not so overgrown anyway. And yeah. there's what you would call the traditional hill walking paths, uh, routes in the Mother Hills have been so well walked that there's a walk, there's only open paths there anyway. But yes, <clears throat> the rank vegetation is a real issue, and our next thing is to get, have a pink holiday. I to bring in some pigs two or three weeks and stir up some of the ground, particularly the areas of really rank and fescue grass that hardly changed at all. And, uh, you know, clearly restricting any kind of natural succession of plant life in general, not just trees and stalks. Yeah. This yeah. would have been done last year, we had it set up, but of course the COVID came along. Uh, so we're hoping to do this all. Uh, and of course, there are wild boar much further in the Prussia. If they happen to make their own way there, that would be fine. We, we can't possibly introduce them because we would be liable to manage them and farm them and so on. But, but as far as I understand the law, if they just have to turn up by themselves, we can get their advantage without them. Take responsibility as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Paul, uh, what's the next question you've selected? Um, from Ian Francis, grazing animals are a natural part of the ecosystem. Do you have in mind a number of deer you should keep within the site? Well, we don't have an exact number, but we work on the vegetation and we stalk cull deer. We've never fenced them out. We had a few small deer enclosures around the remnant woodlands just to begin with, just to let them flourish. So we've always stalked deer with the very notion that, of course, we want some browsing. We don't want to get rid of it, which is why, apart from difficulties, practical difficulties of topography, why we don't want to use deer fencing. Uh, and obviously, if you're claiming grant money to plant trees and things, then you have to uh, make sure your trees are get to a certain height where you won't get the money. But yes, in the longer term, Things like possibly proxies might be the answer. You might get in like some heavy hoofed, you know, like uh, Highland cattle or Galloway cattle or something like that. But at the moment, that would tie us to farming and welfare of animals and a whole lot of stuff that we're just not getting into. Uh, so at the moment, we're kind of stuck with deer, the odd hares and stuff. Uh, but this idea of a pig holiday, we want to see what happens. And if it works the way we think it will, then that would help stir up the ground. But depending on how things, I believe, for instance, in Sweden, I think it's Sweden, you can actually take Highland cattle, black cattle, and get a license to run them as wild animals for conservation purposes. Now, if we could do something like that in Scotland, take, us, take away all the farming legislation laws and welfare issues, then yes, I, it's the kind of thing I could easily imagine. Two or three wild cattle would just let them go wild, do their own thing. Uh, but the that sounds like a challenge. Missing prey, exactly. But the whole yeah. issue of missing bigger animals, never mind the usual culprits of fox and lynx and so on. Uh, but stuff like the original wild cattle, it's a real issue, yes. Uh, okay. Can I stop you there? There are loads of questions. We don't have time for. Yeah. Well, we have time for just one more. Can I ask you uh, this question from David Welch? Very interesting one. Can you tell us what species have been lost due to lack of grazing, or which you suspect might have been lost? Uh, none so far. And huh. this That's is great news. Ah, well, this is what really interests me, especially about doing this. Is I want to watch as great watching the plants not uh, become extinct, not disappear, but return to their original niches. Many of these plants are only widespread uh, because they've taken advantage of other changes. Nardus grassland, Nardus being a classic example, all over the middle slopes. You take away grazing, it soon retreats uphill back to the sort of higher ground where it originally came from. Wild thyme is a very good example. And many of us thought, well, you clearly are going to lose wild thyme in the grassy swamps, 
or base rich grasses first, because it's going to become overwhelmed. That's very true. However, there is now almost certainly more wild thyme that can ripen now because it's sprawled all over the screes, dry rocky faces, and so on. Places where, when it appeared under sheep and goats, it just was immediately nibbled. Uh, Stuart, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there. Yeah. Uh, that was fantastic. So interesting. So inspiring. Uh, well done. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Now, like I say, there, there are loads of questions for you, and we've only uh, you've only answered a few. Uh, so th there might be another opportunity to two questions to Stuart during the general Q and A session at twelve forty five. Yeah, uh, that's so, fine. Yeah. So if, if you're able to stick around uh, for that, that'd be great. Otherwise, yeah. perhaps you could dive into the Q and A um, box yourself and, yeah. and answer. To uh, some of those questions. Yeah, will do. Yes, excellent. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>